That's great. So welcome everybody to our second lecture, our second Amplify lecture of the semester. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. And um, so my name is Professor Amy sanchez Artiaga, and I am facilitating the Amplify lecture series for students this semester. Before we begin with our lecture, I'd like to acknowledge the Kumeyaay people whose land our university is built upon, and also acknowledge that Melo Brown, our guest speaker this evening, is seated upon upon the land of the Tongva people. Um, we recognize and we value the continued relationship between these communities and their territories. And we offer our thanks for their continued stewardship of these unceded lands. Um, welcome again, students. Uh, faculty and community to the second lecture of uh, this fall's Amplify lecture series. The SDSC community thanks Michelle Schlecht for her generous uh, continued support of Amplify through the Michelle Schlecht Visiting Artists Fund. So thank you so much, Michelle, for allowing us to bring um, great thinkers like, like Mello to campus. Amplify Responding in Context is a lecture series that centers the production of uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, and LGBTQIA plus people and people with disabilities in order to equip students and participating community members with the necessary context and critical perspectives to participate and engage meaningfully with urgent polemics and debates in contemporary cultural production. Tonight, our speaker is Mello Brown. Uh, Mello is a screenwriter and a graphic novelist based in Los Angeles. He attended, he attended Cleveland State University and he's a member of the Writers Guild of America. And his practice as a writer and a cultural producer has been informed by his parallel careers outside of the arts as an aviation mechanic for the Navy, a data analysis engineer, and work on artificial intelligence to help urban communities. While working as a tech editor for forallnerds.com, he led a wave of dozens of acclaimed articles to create an online home for pop culture geeks of color. Since then, he's written for Stars and Apple TV Plus for shows uh, like American Gods. Most recently, uh, Brown has worked alongside Kay Perkins, Mike Johnson, and Fernando Dagnino on a series of graphic novels called Blade Runner Origins, which the students um, who are in my class um, and I read in advance of, of this um, talk, but me members of the public who haven't done so, we encourage you to, to grab that, take a look at it. Um, in this text, um, like in much of his work, um, he, he makes visible questions of inclusion and exclusion to complicate and present rich nuanced narratives that invite viewers to question and reflect on the emotional landscapes that they bring to visual and literary texts. Brown's work presents us with speculative fictions that include and value a diversity of characters, voices, and experiences of our imagined terrains of the future. Work that asks us to interrogate our lived experience now and today, and imagine and speculate upon the kind of futurity we enact in the present moment. The breadth of his work and his career path demonstrate for us the richness and value that life experience can have in our lives as creators, thinkers, and artists. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Mello Brown. Yay! Welcome, Mello. We're happy Thank you're you. here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I really appreciate be just being here. And uh, for everyone that read the book. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, It's been a ton of work and I feel very lucky to even be able to be a part of this franchise and talk about so much <laughs> in regards to what it, uh, what it was, what it is, and hopefully what it will be in the future. And uh, I, I love like just seeing um, just so many people here and I'm sure so, so many people here are from like very just different diverse backgrounds. So I kind of want to dive in first into just how to even get into the industry itself and sort of like the path that I took because the same path isn't the path that everybody will take. And uh, as you said, what was it? Uh, I was uh, born in Cleveland, Ohio. I was in the United States Navy and actually went into there to help out my folks. Uh, so, you know, like, like a lot of people do when they join the military uh, is usually uh, quite often, I should say, uh, it's 
education and uh, I want my <laughs> I want my folks to do better. And uh, especially coming from a rougher background, once again, Cleveland, Ohio. So, <laughs> so uh, I ended up becoming an aviation mechanic in the process, uh, went through all of that, left the Navy. And then uh, one thing that was very weird was that I became a slot engineer for Caesars Entertainment and helped uh, build the world's first uh, outdoor slot machine. And uh, that was over in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, in the pro uh, uh, trust me, this all loops around. Uh, in the process of doing that, uh, that slot machine started to bring in somewhere around like $60 million a week. And uh, it definitely started to uh, bring in money for the state because they take a high percentage of that. And in the process of doing that, the governor at the time was just like, oh man, this is really, really dope. Uh, what if we started to use some of this and some of the other businesses in the area that are also bringing in money to unfortunately start gentrifying the area around it. That was in 2014. And as they started, uh, as they started to do that, that kind of gave the okay, well, that definitely gave the okay for police to become more aggressive. And a lot of that is what led, that was just one of the pieces that led into the Baltimore riots happening. Uh, from there, just completely hit a point where I was more focused on finding ways to help rebuild that community, was pushing back during that entire incident. And I had hit like this really tough and terrible down point in my life where I uh, was not interested in working on uh, working with another corporation again, no longer doing this anymore, uh, just taking my skills elsewhere. And I actually went to New York, which uh, for a lot of people who live in Baltimore, that often feels like it's the city down the street. And uh, when going there, I ended up working in a lot of, uh, well, I know they call them maker spaces now, but I ended up working in a lot of hacker spaces. And a lot of that was more, a lot of that work there was focused on helping build ICOs and cryptocurrency to help Syrian refugees at the time when the crisis in Syria was happening to for them to place their identity inside of those currencies and a lot of their money so that way they can actually immigrate to other places and have encrypted proof of who they were and uh, it made the process a lot easier which is something you don't hear talked about often similar to how um, cryptocurrency is being used in Nigeria to help protesters uh, we often hear about it in America in a, in the form of like how is this dude trying to get a Lamborghini or something. But, but in, in that form, that was something where I saw it as just, it is a need that's, that needs to be made now. Uh, I don't agree with the environmental issues that it causes, but also those are people who are immediately that need help. Uh, this actually led to a point where um, <laughs> I started working with Complex Magazine and helping them out with a lot of articles and stuff like that. While also had a friend who was also working on a lot of geeky stuff at the at, at complex as well. And they just kind of suggested, why don't we give them sort of like a robots and skateboards place for, for black guys <laughs> in, in their own podcast, which at the time was called uh, Fan Bros. And that was known as uh, For All Nerds. And uh, it's still available now, forallnerds.com with uh, DJ Ben Ami and Tatiana King Jones. And at that time, Believe it or not, that was only around 2015, and there were so many different uh, publications and so many different outlets that had no idea that there were um, just geeks of color, is the best way to put it. So they were just like, oh, we're making a Luke Cage show, we're making uh, a Star Trek show, etc. We're just going to throw everyone who is uh, Black or Latinx, et cetera, all onto your podcast and just talk to them uh, because maybe that could help get, raise their audience. And it grew to a point where we got very lucky where we had showrunners start to come in, including uh, Brian Fuller, who you may know from Hannibal and American Guts. And uh, at the time he was trying to, um, he was trying to actually get a hold on what should I do about American Gods in a way and how do you feel about it, et cetera. And uh, 
he kind of cut the mic and asked us like, how do you, how do you feel about American Gods? And very critically, and I put, I say this very, uh, <laughs> uh, I say this in a way that we were making sure that we were being very constructive with our criticism as well. We went, ugh, mainly because uh, there was a, there was a scene within the pilot where the main character who is black is hung from a tree. And then later in the season, when it's addressed again, he's just kind of like, sometimes that happens to me kind of thing. And uh, it, it's, and we were just like, this is how you fix that. This is how you go forward with this character who is your main character that this can't, this can no longer be ignored. Uh, that we need to start focusing on who he is as a person, how he processes things, and the ways to move this into the future. It wasn't reinventing the wheel, but it, we were definitely just trying to fix it. So we were just like, he's going to leave and go back to LA. We'll see what happens or anything like that. And um, at, at the time, me and my writing partner, we, uh, we were just like, well, we'll just go back to uh, working on our regular podcast stuff. But we got an email and he said, hey, you're moving out to LA in two weeks. You're now going to be writing on American Gods. Uh, and I say this because this is a really weird way to go about getting into the industry, specifically for screenwriting. But please keep in mind that all of your life experiences, all those things I said, they all add up. All those things uh, equal uh, sometimes a lot more than what we see coming from writers who have very similar backgrounds in television where they all may have went to Yale and then they were just like, I'll be a writer assistant for a couple years, which is a very difficult job. And writer's assistants are amazing. Um, but they like slowly work their way up the ladder and then they get to the point of writing, which a lot of, a lot of them are excellent writers. But the problem that a lot of uh, different studios and publications and um, whatnot, they, they have a lot of issues in regards to all their experiences are exactly the same. So when you put a lot of the same person into a room and they're just agreeing with each other, sometimes you don't get great art out of that. So all the experiences that all of you are having right now in life and a lot of things that you're doing, it does matter in terms of the things that you're gonna be bringing into your art whether it's writing or anything else, it's so important to embrace those things because that's a big part of who you are. Even going on to American Gods from there, um, it was like they, they, they specifically were just like, we have villains that we just don't know how to write because all the villains are based on new technology and their plans would specifically be based around technology that's happening today. And a lot of writers came from similar backgrounds. So they were just, they, they were like, we, we were lucky when we could turn on Facebook sometimes. So I ended up giving them uh, sort of the groundwork and where they needed to go with like, well, if your villain was related to net neutrality at, at a point, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that kind of builds you into a direction and curves things out. So that way you're filling in a gap that's needed. It's just like any other job. You find out exactly why they want to have you in an interview to begin with and you fill that void and your experiences and your backgrounds and the things that make you you and original and yourself are absolutely important and you should absolutely embrace it in your heart uh so going forward we're going to fast forward a bit uh was very lucky to be asked to write on blade runner origins uh, it's absolutely insane that they allowed me to write the origin story to the franchise. Um, so it's it's been a wild ride, specifically starting off, because uh, one thing is very difficult when writing, and one thing you're going to run into a lot as well, is that people, particularly producers, uh, particularly production companies and publications, they're going to very specifically ask you to throw a little bit of yourself into it. And then if they get nervous, they'll ask you to pull back. I am not very great at the pullback part. 
So unfortunately, uh, the first thing I asked when they said, we want to invite you to write Blade Runner Origins. I'm like, sweet, can we talk about Blade Runners or Slave Catchers? And uh, that was my biggest issue with the entire franchise. Besides the, well, equally a big issue with like, hey, can we talk about like Harrison Ford is incredibly terrible in the first movie uh, to women, particularly uh, how he treats uh, the, just his co-lead in the movie and basically assaults her at a point. And we kind of see that continued <laughs> in the second movie, 2049, where uh, you can actually mute the the lead, who is uh, the other lead in the movie, who, who is also a woman. And it's one of those things where I'm just like, this is not, if you want to talk about why Blade Runner doesn't bring in a lot of money, why it doesn't make Star Wars dollars, that it still has this level of cult classic to it, but it, it's not accessible to so many people. You need to look and be reflective of why those things are broken. So there was many, many conversations that I brought that up. <laughs> and it was, uh, and the only way that I was able to actually push back to get to the point where I could actually write this book was to present like, this is what I wanna do. This is the reason why I will benefit you. And the best reason I could show that it will benefit them is that you will now be able to be more accessible to women, the LGBTQ plus community and people of color around the world if we start having these conversations as to what a Blade Runner is and that what it actually is trying to do is be an introspective story about what makes this person a villain and when is the day when they quit what is the day where they just like, I'm not redeemable, but at the same time, I need to do something to fight against all the destruction that I made prior. And that's what brought me to Blade Runner Origins. And the book itself, for those who haven't had the opportunity to read it, it is a story of Cal Moreau, who is eventually going to become the first Blade Runner. He is also from the military, uh, comes from a background where he was also forced to be there and uh, he is immediately replaced by uh, replicants that are also becoming soldiers in space. So when he comes back to earth he still owes a debt to the government that has been paying for his sister in the hospital who was comatose. Uh, and the way that they have him actually work around that is that they turn him into a detective and then just like you're forced to work on the streets and police the area where he was where he was born, and it's a very introspective look of what uh well it's noir. Noir is always going to be focused on a character being in a place where they are already complacent, or they are in a position that is questionable. And as they go down the rabbit hole of these stories, and that goes from Blade Runner to Minority Report to even uh, classics like the Mountain Falcon, they are slowly deteriorating parts of their selves and their characters in the process and, and revealing like, oh, maybe I am the problem. Maybe I am the toxic thing in my environment and maybe I should change from there. And sometimes that leads to the character's death. And sometimes that leads to the death of everything around them. And the thing I wanted to do with Blade Runner was that this leads to the death of all the toxicity going forward within the franchise. And not only that, but it starts to explain why these other characters that we've seen have are this way, but more importantly, why every Blade Runner eventually cracks and why they break. And I wanted to set the foundation for that here. So that is a, uh, what Blade Runner Origins is, and yeah. Mel, would it be helpful, do you want me to throw up those images? Do you want to talk through some of the images or should we put some of those up on the screen now? Would you want, do you want to do that? Sure. Sure, okay, let me, I will share the screen. Cool, so um, we can maybe start so we have some of the cover art. Um, you could just let me know how you want me to kind of cycle through if you want. 
Just like oh yeah, you, um, yeah, you can just continue the cycle. Um, so in the process of uh, making Blade Runner Origins, and this is uh, actually kind of like a great lesson with uh, uh, comic books as a whole. One of the things that uh, actually led me to really want to dig into a comic book and to even sell this as a comic book first is that there is a, a little bit more freedom in writing a comic book than there is in regards to writing um, television. In television, you are usually writing your first draft or you're writing your outline. And then it has to go through a pass to your producers. Uh, it has to go through the network. And then it has to go to, uh, if it's a property like this, the rights owner. And then after that, they're just like, okay, now write the script. And then you write your first draft and they give a pass and then they write the notes. And this is a long process that it, it goes over and over. Uh, this book in particular, because it is related to the Blade Runner franchise, also went through those passes. But at the same time, it the, their pass, uh, like I was very lucky to also have producers that were just like, you know what, if you uh, put another fight scene in this, or if you have something very uh, chaotic in here, just for a moment, as we get, uh, as we continue to be introspective, but these characters um, suddenly have <laughs> a giant trash, uh, trash can thrown at them, then we're good, then we're good, we, we, <laughs> we hit that mark. So you're, you're going to get that as you're like, uh, and that's kind of a big part of working in major franchises as well. It's like, you have to spoon feed the morals <laughs> Uh, while you're also putting like tons and tons of really dope sugar in there and um uh, and i also want to be very thankful to uh fernando bagnino who is uh, our lead artist on this for providing so much of that sugar because uh that man draws like just drip on everybody but um it there's also just the design of the world itself and how it's going to be how it is constantly just this major reflection um yeah that one's actually good uh, like this concept of what los angeles is in a cyberpunk world and this um alternate universe of what it is but it still has a lot of the issues that we currently have so a lot of those things would be uh, global warming as we're starting to see like a lot of the destruction around the world is is pulling people into los angeles and it has this certain type of glow and the neon glow of cyberpunk are was something that i always wanted to address because if you were to turn the knee off all, like if you just completely shut it down for like five minutes you would see that everything would look horrible uh, those characters that you see in Blade Runner in the background, they're usually drab, gray. No one's having a good time in Blade Runner. <laughs> no, no one's really enjoying being there. But you don't get those stories. You don't get that piece of the puzzle of what it would be like to exist there. Like in regards to even a replicant, and a replicant is someone who is having self realization for the first time when, whenever they rebel. Um, they're used as their slaves. They're used as just for service and their knowledge is supposed to be limited, but anyone who collects enough information about themselves and has the ability to form an opinion is a person. And the minute that they have the realization where they start to feel the need to choose and they start to choose things about themselves and realize who they wanna be going forward, uh, then you have a full person who wants to run and they fully have the right to and they there's also the issue of if these are the uh synthoids i should say uh that took the place of the people who are working everyday jobs and uh the ones who were uh, everything from cooks to house cleaners to everyone who's just uh picking you up in a cab like what happened to the people that they replaced. And that's something else that I want to address in the story that, and, and most of the time we see cyberpunk, a lot of writers are just like, yeah, everything's dark and bridgy and dirty. So everybody's just thieves and they shoot each other, et cetera, et cetera. And coming from a background where I grew up um, just amongst a lot of cultures and I was invited to those communities and groups it's one of those things where a lot of people who work in cyberpunk don't look like me and 
when they think about like uh like yeah deep grungy city i'm like you you really don't know what that is you really don't know what that's about or what it looks like you don't know how that community works you don't know what it's like to go home for dinner and, and like when you go home for dinner in, in certain neighborhoods that's just dope like it i lived in a neighborhood that had so many different types of people that i was able to <laughs> i remember my mom would send me outside with whatever she made for dinner and was able to swap with a family across the street and they were Russian. And then there was another family um, that was like a little bit further down the street near South Korea. And there was uh, another set of neighbors that were, uh, that lived um, like on the corner, uh, which we were pretty close to and they were a Puerto Rican family. And like they would send all the kids out <laughs> into the middle of the street. We just kind of like swap a little bit of each dinner. And then we come back in and then we have like this larger full meal of a variety of things. And when you think about a time like this in cyberpunk and how it, it's, if global warming is happening, similar to what's actually happening in real life, when we have these instances where so many people, we see so many communities that are like black and brown that are being immediately affected right now, that are, suffering from so many changes and they have to migrate eventually to different places just for safety that a lot of these communities aren't going to be how they are portrayed within cyberpunk all the time some of them will be in this place where it's just like no we want to make a home we need to humanize these characters and we need to put them in a place where they actually feel comfortable being there and they can adapt not everyone's going to have a flying car but that doesn't mean that their life is terrible, you know? And that was kind of one of the big things I wanted to hit with Blade Runner while also talking about the, the value of these people, particularly the value of bodies, because there's no way you can talk about the future and there's no way that you can actually talk about uh, the modification of synthoids as people and characters without also talk, telling a story about bodies. And that can be the value of the people that we just discussed, but that also can be the value of the replicants and their discovery of identity. And so when we start to dig into identity, we wanted to actually have the first rebellious replicant be trans. That is someone uh, being that character Asa, uh, for those who read the book and spoilers, if you haven't, it's all good. We're, I'm gonna spoil a lot. Uh, <laughs> or um, the, the suspected killer replicant is actually not a killer, it's actually the victim who placed himself inside of uh, a male, uh, male presenting replicant body, having that choice to completely change, to experience who they always wanted to be. And they're also dealing with a lot of the things that come with that and a lot of the, the major changes of both the identity that they've now presented us, but also the identity of immediately going into being a minority within this space. And these are the conversations I always wanted to have in Blade Runner more than just Harrison Ford, shooty shooty. Like it's the question of just what is it like to have such a horrible job? And why, why would you break? What, is, what are the things that make the people in this world and why would this person this main character actually go about becoming a blade runner and being the first one in the process because at the end of the day uh more spoilers for the book his entire goal is to sabotage every blade runner going forward and that has been <laughs> the most difficult discussion while even working on this particular franchise uh of basically changing the concept of uh, Blade Runners as you are watching villains realize that they are villains. And that is really the only way I would ever work on this book and it, and to have it be presented to anyone if it has my name on it because uh, turning Harrison Ford into a hero, I never found that interesting. And the journey of Kay in 2049 is more of a conversation about his uh, self-discovery and his search for individuality 
to the point where he completely defies the fact that he he just doesn't do his job anymore because there's no point there's no meaning in it and part of that is just rebellion because a lot of writers often forget that a key part of writing cyberpunk is that the word punk is in there. like we're here to rebel against all of the pretty skyscrapers you see in the background of this picture and that's what's important to me so um Thank, thank you so much, Mila, for that like really wonderful overview of the world that you are trying to create and the intervention that your artwork is seeking to make in this kind of existing right like cosmology and universe of Blade Runner. I think that's so helpful, um, and it's for me it's really empowering to listen to you talk about how it is that um, by I think applying right like your personal experience and your perspective and your embodied knowledge to that franchise, there is new understandings and openings and ultimately like a rehumanization of these um, of these narratives that are already like at their heart narratives around questions of like who is human and how do we create categories or or delimitations around that. So um, thank you so much. I, I feel really grateful for that. Um, I would it be would you feel good going to uh, the student questions now and maybe we can Absolutely. start looking at a few of those. Um, I want to let everybody all of the students in the class know that Mello was so um, just like taken and excited and grateful for your questions. And so thank you for doing your work. Thank you for having good citational practice um and writing good questions um yeah if i could comment on that uh, i usually because i'm writing blade runner i usually get um 45 year old podcasters that are really like they're like harrison ford so cool you ever want to talk about them i'm like fuck no dude like <laughs> and it's it's i don't know if i can curse or stuff but um <laughs> <You're it's, done. laughs> But uh, it, it's one of those things where uh, I completely wanted to push that narrative aside and talk about the world as a whole. And a minute that I'm just like, yeah, Blade Runners are slave catchers. And it's like quiet for five minutes <laughs> or whatever podcast. Uh, I'm usually doing it from there. So, uh, and these questions that you all have asked are far more insightful, um, interesting and fun than anything I've received yet. So thank all of you. Yeah, great job, everybody. So Melo, I don't know, do you want to, um, do you want to choose or do you want me to be your wing woman and pick a, pick a few out? Is there any that you wanted to respond to uh, that just you were like excited by that you want to start with or you want me to do it? Um, too hard to choose if you could be okay. my wing woman. Would... Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. So I think one of the first questions that we received, it's a little bit of a long one and it's also a person um, who watched a previous interview with you. So I'm, I'm just gonna read it. I think, actually I think this is from, and you can correct me, but I think this is from Joe. Um, so Joe, you can tell me if that's not true in the comments and somebody else can, can jump in. Um, but it says in the, in the interview you did with Andrew Summer for Forbidden Planet uh, TV's YouTube channel, you mentioned that your introduction to Blade Runner franchise was through uh, media referencing it like Tiny Toons and having an episode uh, dedicated to it and Bubblegum Crisis being more subtle with it. Um, when writing Blade Runner Origins, did you find yourself pulling in inspiration from other sci-fi or cyberpunk media um, uh, like Akira or Ghost in the Shell. Also, uh, was there anything from the Blade Runner movie itself you wanted to avoid in Blade Runner origins? Like, for example, maybe you didn't like um, how they treated female characters. Um, uh, yeah, and I think you already spoke about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> And to also rectify the lack of diversity. So I think that's a very big question, but I, I think it's a good one to start with um, because uh, what the student did was I think weave together a lot of threads that several people asked about. It was a little bit of a, there was some repeats of that question. So maybe we could start there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, in regards to um, other things that inspired me, um, there were also cyberpunk like uh, Akira or Ghost in the Shell. 
uh, yeah, those things will always, it, the minute that you write the genre of cyberpunk on your first page, uh, those things loom over you immediately. They're, those two are masterpieces in particular. Um, I definitely say the one particular cyberpunk project that is also an anime that uh, definitely led me down the path of the, a lot of conversations that I want to talk about uh, was a work called uh, uh, Psychopaths. Mm-hmm. And um, if you haven't seen Psychopaths, it, it is one of the best works of art that is just uh, so fuck the police in regards to how it's dealing with um, like the concept of like a minority report or anything like that, which is uh, the, this ex- exploration of if your mind is already tilting over the edge of radicalism or extremism or anything like that they will um they are judge and jury and they can kill you on the spot and uh any prisoner who is considered like potentially redeemable now has to work for them to help them catch these people before they commit a murderous crime and as they're doing this they're going down this journey of usually discovering how terrible their job is and often the people who are the police in the process, they find themselves flipping to become the people who are hunted because their psychosis just can't take how terrible the murders that they're committing is. And it is an absolute masterpiece. It is amazing. And um, in terms of the its rebellion, its rebelliousness by kind of wearing this facade of being very uh, uh, being very conforming and uh, these characters that are being complacent and they're just slowly cracking it, I think that is the definition of what cyberpunk is it's um, when technology has gone to the point these major corporations and it's just like yeah I'm a cop that works for Amazon basically uh, which is how I think of um, even our main character Cal Moreau where he's kind of the police officer who where the police are can easily be bought at any moment. And that's it, it, that puts him in a place where he is always gonna be working for corporate interests. And it slowly starts to chip away until the last page of issue four where he just throws away the badge completely. And cyber or psychopaths, I definitely say is my biggest, my biggest inspiration there. Uh, in regards to uh, looking at the lack of diversity in Blade Runner, yeah, that's that's like, <laughs> that, that immediately hit me where I was just like, oh, I think the the one thing I wanted to focus on um, as well, which we address uh, later in the book, and also by having one of our leads be um, Asian American, is the fact that Blade Runner is quite xenophobic, uh, particularly the the Harrison Ford movie, like. If you even look on the screen behind me and there's like this, like the the Asian lady on the screen, like that's not good. That that is actually made from a place where in the 80s, there was this huge fear that because Japan was having this economic boom, that they would eventually completely take over um, America and they would be the dominant culture over here. And it's really disgusting. Never put that in cyberpunk anything because we should always move past that. And dealing and having this as an origin story is very hard to pick at it, but being able to speak about the actual citizens on the ground, the, the people of color who exist in this space, being able to write a line in the book where um, a black woman is driving a speeder and she's like, I'm so sick of driving through these holograms of uh, three geishas trying to sell me skin lighteners is, like such, <laughs> it, 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 it felt better to address it and to pinpoint it out because uh, that was actually one of my requests going forward that Blade Runner completely avoids that going forward. And if we're going to actually have a conversation of why other cultures are in LA, it should be because these people immigrated here. And it's because we're looking at the businesses that they own and that they have agency to move forward in these spaces. Yeah, I think that that's a, a really valuable thing. Um, in in the 
chat, um, Joe, who did ask the question, adds, it's also that Orientalism uh, riddles the cyberpunk genre. So um, yes. it's, it's gross. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I do. I think did we hit all the components of that question? Should I pull another one, or <laughs> do you feel good? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I feel good. All right, cool. Um, so I think um, another, so all of the speakers um, in the series, Mello is, uh, I explained in our kind of initial conversation about the class visit. We've, I've been asking them um, these three kind of big um, overarching questions. And so uh, I think in a lot of ways, you've already um, started to answer some of those questions and some of these also um, connect kind of tangentially um, to, to some of the, the presentation that, you, that you've given us. Um, but I wanted to just ask really um, specifically and kind of particularly because when I initially shared these questions with you, one of the things um, that you wrote to me about and that we kind of spoke about was how for you, it's really important important to pull from actual experience um, and actual, so not just lived experience, but also the kind of deep emotional life that human beings have and the complexities of our emotions to make sci-fi and to make speculative fiction that feels real, right? So to imbue um, that with um, the, the texture of real kind of lived experience. And so I wonder if you could maybe just elaborate upon that for all of us. Um, I know that there's students in the class who um, have an interest in sci-fi and speculative fiction, but all of us are being trained as artists, right? So what are maybe some um, tips around that and that kind of process and what that has been like for you as you've written this text? Yeah, absolutely. Um whenever you write sci-fi you're it's it, i would say it's still going to be the same process of you're going to find the emotion that you're trying to hit in the core of a person of uh, uh, providing new language for experiences that may not already have a word i think a great example of that would be if you look at something like get out which technically you could say sci-fi considering how um the the sunken place works and the sunken place is now a word and a phrase where if you said that to someone they're like oh you know kind of thing and like it, it totally makes sense now and when you work in sci-fi it's usually you providing character and rich texture to a lot of these uh supernatural events whether it's magic or whether it's robots or anything like that you're providing the experiences that you have felt before. Um, even going into Blade Runner, um, that came from, uh, it, it's probably apparent that a lot of what Cal Moreau feels comes from what I felt in my twenties while being in the Navy. There hits a, there, there was a point that hit, particularly for me, I can't say for everybody, but for me, where I was just like, oh, I am a product, I am a, thing uh, here. Um, a lot of the things I was experiencing uh, in the military was designed to desensitize me. So that not only for it, it like changed my value of life, both in myself and others, as either could be taken away due to whatever operation that I may be involved in at the time. And um, that became the most apparent on the day that I received dog tags. Um, a lot of people show dog tags is just like, like you, like this means like, you know, freedom, whatever you want to say. Um, I'm like, this is my serial number. This literally puts me in the exact same position as what a replicant would be. Um, and we don't address that enough in other parts of the Blade Runner franchise where the Blade Runners themselves are not that different from the replicants because to the people that they work for, they are also things. And uh, being able to take your experiences in this world, not just always tragedy. I am, I am uh, not one for always tragedy. Uh, unfortunately, Blade Runner is, is a series designed around that, but also a lot of joys that people don't necessarily know like how dope it is to be uh, a person of color in so many moments in life. 
and uh, which is why uh, within the next volume of Blade Runner, I dip into that. Like, there's another section. It's called the sl the slums. Is what uh, it's referred to in the city. But they really enjoy being there. They don't have the flying car problem. It's just these people that exist in their own space, and that's dope to them. And it's the only section of cyberpunk that is happy because they don't have to deal with the corporations like just right outside on the other side of the water. And uh, being able to take those things and just recontextualizing, like maybe this can happen with a spell or maybe this can happen with a robot. I don't want to pitch anything because y'all are artists, y'all got it. And I also got stuff that I need to pitch, but, <laughs> um, but that's, that's usually how you get there. Find that thing in you that you experienced and pull it out. Yeah, thank you, Melo. I think that's good advice. They No, they have things to pitch in this class. I I know it, I've read it. I'm excited for it. I'm excited for the future. Um, so before so, I open up, so I, I think before I pull questions, what I'm gonna do now, because I forgot that I I was putting us, okay. So I'm, I've allowed everybody to unmute themselves now. I just, so I've been keeping it on in the beginning just so that we have a kind of uninterrupted time in the beginning, but I wanna invite, so if folks wanna raise their digital hand, I can call on people. Um, and if you'd like, if, if you'd like to ask Mello a question directly, um, you're, you're invited to at this time. But yes, Delaney. Um, so do you find it limiting like with what you can do with each frame in terms of like the emotions and speech and like movement of the characters? 100%, it is always extremely limiting. Um, the, it, it takes a, a process of outlining uh, prior to writing any issue. And uh, there's so much that you want to say, especially if you're talking about <laughs> the things that make us human, to sum it up in like a little word bubble is very, very hard. Um, the, the best process for that is usually, uh, well, A, is usually long walks of just like, what is a one sentence that would explain what it feels like to be a person and to sum it up in one way. And um, a, a lot of what, this book has turned into is actually that. It's actually finding what is the word that kind of describes rebellion. And a lot of, and that to me is hope. Like uh, you, you fight out of terrible situations because you're hoping for something better instead of um, the way that other people look at it that are the villains of the series, the corporations or whatnot, that see it as something uh, more destructive. But being able to crunch it down into one word <laughs> and then explain why that word matters so much um, within like a few more bubbles is an easy way to do that. And also uh, Cal Moreau is a person where he definitely doesn't speak a lot. He is uh, like uh, being able to have an artist like Fernando is extremely important. If you're going into graphic novels, Make sure you have an artist that is really good with all expressions. And sometimes there's a conversation between you and them in regards to what they're going to be doing with so different instances and how they want to portray it and, and how good are they with emotions. And that's even a lot of conversations I have with Fernando, especially for some difficult things coming up. And uh, that gives you the space to say something sarcastic and someone has like an eyebrow up and a cheek in a certain direction, but you being very distinct when you say that. So that way you do not have to spell it all out in words. And it gives it a very cinematic feel as well. Thank you. Delaney, did that answer your question? Yes, that was very, very good explanation. <laughs> Thank you, Delaney. Anyone else? Would anybody else like to ask a question of Mella directly? Maybe we're feeling shy. That's okay. All good. That's like, oh yes, Natalia, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Uh, perfect. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention that I'm not a person that usually gave much try to science fiction, but Blade Runner really made me rethink about trying new movies and new comic books about it, the topic, because I found it really inspiring and in, on reflecting on those topics. And I really love the art style of the comic book. And uh, my question to you would be, besides the science fiction, what other films would you recommend uh, learning more about and searching of it and that inspired you? First of all, thank you so much. Uh, that means a lot to me. Um, and I actually, uh, this is kind of a funny answer, but the, the space that I've really been digging into lately has been uh, just Japanese anime. And the reason why is because A, um, when we all kind of watch the same thing um, in Western media, I want to make sure that I, we all don't have the same idea because we all watched Ted Lasso last week and it, it kind of cannibalizes it. We, we kind of cannibalize each other for it accidentally. It's never intentional, but it happens sometimes. But the other thing is that in Japan, their experiences have been so different and they're using the art of being able to draw and create whatever they want and animate those emotions in a certain way. Um, there's even stuff where it appeal, there, there's particular properties that appeal to people in completely different ways that are still saying something so special. One particular project I think of is like One Punch Man, which is a very goofy name and is very popular. And a lot of people like that. It's just a dude who is dressed like a very lazy superhero who punches things one time and they explode. But the actual uh, story that is trying to tell is millennial burnout and, or just workers burnout of any generation where he is a person who is in this particular place where he has this huge fear of going back into the office. He's so sick of it. He's done with it. And so he starts to do regular push-ups and sit-ups every day. <laughs> and somehow that makes him like nearly invincible. So he's like, sweet, I could be a superhero now. But immediately when he becomes a superhero, there's like tons of paperwork. There's a lot of uh, issues in regards to uh, like, he's incredibly strong, but he isn't very educated. So they put him at C class, even though he can help them in any situation that they pull them into. And he's also in this place where he's just, um, <laughs> he still doesn't have the money. He needs to get coupons. So he'll leave a fight to go to, to a checkout line because this is the only day that they have fruit on sale. And like, it's uh, this interesting story about um, this person who is in this particular uh, place in life, but it's kind of disguised around this very like bright lights, I'm a punch superheroes kind of uh, storyline. And a there's tons and tons of uh, science fiction and uh, particularly anime right now that's doing that. We even have something like um, Wonder Egg Priority that is just about women trying to figure out how to stop abusers and doing that within this parallel universe. And a lot of them have had friends that have unfortunately taken their own lives. And they're trying to find an opportunity to get them back in this other world or help them after death work through their trauma. And absolutely beautiful first episode pilot that I will never forget for the rest of my life. So uh, yeah, um, I hope you have the opportunity to explore um, more in science fiction because it's, it's a really interesting way to look into subjects by also exploring the things that we can't while we're always just dealing in reality. It's dealing with the potential of what will we have if, we, if one thing was changed and we had this one extra ability. Thank you for that, Mello. Um, thank you for that um, really rich answer. I wonder, is there anybody else that would like to ask a question? No? Guillermo. Uh, hi. Um, I was kind of curious about um, like how you planned out like the story with Blade Runner Origins. Like when you were told like, oh, you're going to be like working on this project. Um, 
I'm sure like you had like a bunch of ideas that come into your head, like how you wanted to do it. Um, but I was curious, like how far ahead did you think with it? Like, did you just think about like the first couple of issues that you would have or just like the first issue and then move on from there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and this is the key to everything that I write, especially on a TV show that I'm on now. I think about where I want to go. Um, I think about um, if I walked away from Blade Runner today, um, I could say that this is what I was saying. Um, it, so I always think about the message that I want to say that happens on the last page and of the, and like issue 12 is like kind of like our big opus. Uh, myself and my writing partner, Kate Perkins. And we were uh, in this place where we were just like, we want to change this franchise to be something that's a bit better and a bit more acceptable. And that's definitely what, what we wanted to do with like, we wanted to point out that Blade Runners were a problem. We wanted to have people feel welcome into the series. We want to have people be able to uh, point at this and be like, this is what Blade Runner is actually about. And from there, uh, there's a, a writing method that I use that not a lot of people use that I call the grindhouse method. And uh, <laughs> the reason why I refer to that is because, um, and um, thank you, Amy, for actually um, so suggesting this assignment before, which is what are the things that make you passionate? Like what are the things where it's just like, uh, like if a character punched another character in the face, it shouldn't just happen because punching faces is a thing that sometimes happen um, in a movie or something. It should happen because it is an important part of a conversation. An action scene is no different than a love scene in terms of what it's trying to say. It's two characters working through something or entering something in terms of their relationship. And it is often a climax or a beginning. And those things are like these very important bullet points of like, I need this to happen at some point in the story. So I wanted to, so I just kind of like literally like really dope things that I've always wanted to see happen in Blade Runner. And then once I had that long list of dope stuff that I wanted to see, built the story as to how these characters get there. I wanted to get to a point where you're reading it. And then like, uh, if you're reading a trade paperback uh, volume two, there's a issue coming up, which is issue eight, where I'm just like, I want whoever is reading this to break out into a sweat. I want you to be like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm incredibly nervous. Um, why is there a battle royale happening in Blade Runner or anything like that? But it's a battle royale that's built on emotion. Every punch is, <laughs> is literally a discussion about where everyone belongs in this world and what people have the right to do and their fight for identity in the process of that happening. So the punches now matter. They have a weight to them where you feel something. So that is definitely my process of outlining and how we kind of planned out what to do with this. Series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other folks want to ask a question? I'll pull out. I keep almost going to like the list and then somebody will raise a hand. So I want to make sure that okay, we get to it. So um, Mello, maybe something that will be helpful because so we're all working on um, this assignment that or these this kind of choose your own adventure assignment that you assigned us, um, and, uh, which I think has been like, I hope it's, it was fun for me. I hope that it's fun for other folks too, because I'm doing the assignments along with the students. Um, and uh, so maybe it's helpful because um, in the second prompt, um, we are creating this kind of list for a replicant to, um, you know, to kind of fake somebody out, right? To a, a list of things that for um, us really define us as, as human. Um, so I wonder if you might talk to us, I know that we've, we've kind of touched upon this um, in numerous different ways, but I wonder if you could elaborate on um, this kind of existence of the replicants um, in Blade Runner. Um, and I know that we haven't 
uh, or at least in what we read, we haven't really gotten like a full kind of fleshed out um, picture for how it is that you sort of envision um, replicants and their agency and who they are in comparison to the way that they exist in the film. But I wonder if you could share a little bit around, um, around them and uh, just as a, a sort of helpful, maybe footnote to the assignment that we're doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I apologize if I dance around the subject a little bit but for legal reasons uh, with, with the franchise. Um, in regards to uh, replicants and who they are and their discovery of people, um, there's one issue that happens after the, the trade paperback in issue five where they discover replicants that are kind of uh, freaking out with the conversation uh, or, or what when they find one who is about to go into a murderous rage and the only thing that he is screaming is why. Um, the, the issue there is that the replicant that is turning other replicants into uh, being rebellious people is basically just asking them that question. Like, why do you do the things that you do? It's very, um, it's very much, well, where Matrix got this entire, the, the Matrix got this entire theme, which is uh, like, why do you wake up every day? So to brush your teeth, put put on like, you know, like your your hard pants <laughs> and then go to work. And, um, and then you sit there or you stand there and you take this stupid coffee order and then you uh, ride a bus home or you get picked up and then you go back to bed and you just do that to wake up the next day. Why do you do it? What is the actual reason why you do it? And a replicant is a slave. They don't have even, like if you were to shoot a replicant in the street, they don't have rights. They don't have, um, like, if they were to attack someone, then there isn't any, like, jury or any court case for them that decides, like, maybe they were in the wrong, maybe they were being abused or anything like that. They're considered a thing, no, no matter the fact that we see that they have opinions, they care, and they want more. So it, it becomes a question um, from there as to like, what what is a replicant actually? Is it like, do you consider it a person? Or but because it gets to experience these emotions or because they were created, are those simulated emotions? And do they deserve a right? So in the process of uh, creating the replicants within this book, a lot of conversation going forward as you're actually, uh, uh, as we go into the next chapter, we introduce eight main character replicants that take over the book from Cal Moreau uh, because we want to create a community of the different opinions of their existence. Because for a lot of people in different diverse backgrounds, they too feel like, um, like it, we, it often feels like we have less rights. It often feels like we are in a place where if we were to do something wrong, there are some people who get three strikes and there's some people who get one. And that's a conversation that these replicants are having amongst themselves, where even when one of them goes completely insane and goes into a point where they go into a murderous rage or anything like that, they're just like, there are also humans that do that. And they still, like some of those humans still get arrested. So a replicant is, it, it, so that's what a replicant always, has always been to me. It's more or less like there are a minority that was created specifically to have less rights. So that way there could be something that you can tell it to do and you can have it be your servant and it gives people of higher power no accountability over the terrible things that are happening to it, which is... Um, I think is the most important thing in cyberpunk as a whole, just a sidebar there, that as technology increases, it helps stronger or people with higher power um, have less and less accountability. And um, the replicants entirely are consuming and completely are victims to this circumstance. Thank you. I think that's a really helpful 
frame and an alternative frame for maybe how that is presented for us in the films. Yeah. Um, so I want to just make sure. So I'm going to ask one more time. Is there anybody that would like to ask a direct question? Because we don't, we have like, we're teetering on that like five minute mark, everybody. So I want to make sure that students get to ask questions if they wish to. Otherwise, I'll ask another question. No, okay. So I want to just because we because we kind of have limited time left together. I want to ask Mello the uh, my favorite question to ask to people is off. It's like the broadest question, and it's just what do you uh, want us to take away from like the strategies or the themes or uh, the approaches that you've discussed with us today? Um, what do you want to leave this community of young scholar? artists um, and educators with this evening, what's most important to you? Um, don't hold back. Um, I was actually told when I was creating my first pilot, um, which was a chaotic event. <laughs> uh, when I was making my first pilot, I, um, there was a whole thing you could look it up on Hollywood Reporter probably, but like all the showrunners got fired off of American Gods. They kept me on for a little bit longer. They're just like, just tell us what to do in season two. We'll, we'll throw some money at you and get out. And uh, and I was just kind of like, okay, what do I what do I do with my career? And everyone's like, well, you write a pilot now, you get on another show, and uh, because now you have the experience. And everyone's opinion of what I should do for a pilot was just like, yeah, just write something like really funny because everyone wants funny stuff right now. Or like write something that's just like, like really cool, but like, like other stuff you see on TV when you see a pilot or anything like that. And I tried that for about like five months and everything I was getting was getting rejected. I couldn't get representation or anything like that. And then I had just like threw everything away and I was just like, I'm just going to write what I know. And I wrote, an extremely rebellious story about a gentrified community that completely went off the grid. And um, they just decided that they would create their own government using their own currency and uh, their own technology. And no, there was nothing that anybody could do about it. And it was about the uh, like really badass hackers that were defending that community against just anyone that was trying to go up against it. And immediately everyone was like, okay, well, uh, you, now you have a rep. Now, <laughs> now you, you have a manager, et cetera. And it was because I wanted to create something that was very like angry and weird. And um, every pilot that I've written after that has had a tone of rebelliousness. I've, I've written comedies about people trying to steal cities that um, are still based around the fact that there's like there are there you know there's crisis happening where people are being kicked out of their homes there's issues happening that need to be discussed and so it has a little something extra it has a meaning to it and it's because i didn't listen to the other people who are just like just write ted last like, <laughs> like or just just write a csi uh episode or anything like that because those people will get overlooked. If you write something very dangerous and weird, I've read a pilot before where someone wrote a story about um, someone who had um, meatloaf for hands. And then uh, someone, and then they one day meet somebody, this, this one lady who has pork chop for feet. And that particular person, she gets hired for everything. Like she gets hired for so many shows. She wrote "This Is Us" I believe. you, and like and and "This Is Us" is good money. But but anyway, um, it, it, but it's because she wanted to take a really weird risk, and she found the heart of a strange subject, and it was just incredible reading it. And it, and when you read something like that in a pile of people who are imitating other work that they've recently seen. And uh, where it's like, um, like I absolutely love Fleabag and I love Atlanta, but I've had tons and tons of scripts that are Fleabag in Atlanta <laughs> land in my lap as I've looked for other writers uh, while I'm trying to work on something else. So whenever someone, if, if someone were to send me uh, something similar to pork chop hands right now or pork chop feet right now, I'd be like, yo, we should talk. I just, I just want to get to know you. I just want to know who you are as a person. 
So my, uh, my takeaway is write who you are, even as if that's extreme. Write your experiences and, and just go for it. Thank you so much, Mellow Brown. Um, I think that's a wonderful reminder um, for, I, I think regardless, right, not all of us are writers in this class, but for whatever form students are making and um, that I think your personal experience, your voice, um, your ideas are particular to you and that's what makes them wonderful. Um, Cause yeah, I, I think that I, your voices all, all matter. Um, and yeah, so I think we're basically at the end of class today. Um, I want to just remind our community members that next week our series continues um, at 530. Our speaker will be Asha Imanville, um, who is a curator based in Chicago, um, who's going to share a little bit about her curatorial project, Raisin, um, which is inspired by the uh, play A Raisin in the Sun by uh, Lorraine Hansberry. So um, uh, I invite Mel, if you want to come back and listen to Asha, you're always invited back to the class. You can always join. No, our that's fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but we so uh, I invite back community members who may want to visit us next week. Um, but Mello, we just thank you again for like all of your very sage advice. Um, and um, yeah, everybody have a have a lovely evening. Um, students, I'll see you on Tuesday. Um, and please remember to do your assignments. <laughs> thank Appreciate you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Have a good thank day. Thank you so much. Bye. Have thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Okay. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs> I just wanted to give people time to say <laughs> bye.